Well, last week I was, uh, I was out of town. I was in uh, Niagara Falls, and, and I know I've asked you many times, or at least a couple times, how, how many of you have been to Niagara Falls. It's really amazing. Just the sheer uh, the violence of that water coming down over the American Falls and the Bridal Falls and the, uh, the U-shaped falls, or what is it, what is it called, U-shaped? Horseshoe Falls. It is a U-shape, right? Close. And it is just amazing. It's amazing. I saw some people fishing there. Can you catch fish out there? There's got to be fish, right, in there? Do they, they actually can make it off that falls? I mean, 90% of fish do. That's intelligent, actually. That's crazy. I don't know how that's possible. If I fell from that height, I would die. But a fish, I don't know. It's pretty cool. If you ever get a chance to go to Niagara Falls, I would say go. And everybody that uh, has gone has said, did you go to the Canadian side? <laughs> no, I didn't. They, uh, they were closed for, for business. <laughs> they said that they, uh, I don't know, we weren't essential or something. I don't know. What's the, what's the problem? They just closed, right? Only open for essential people. So I guess I wasn't invited. But um, it, was a lot, it was a lot of fun to go, nonetheless. And uh, people, uh, how many of you have been on the Maid of the Mist? Anybody? Okay, so one, two. Really? You were on the Maids? Okay, good. Very cool. Very cool. I, we didn't go. It was like 20 bucks a person, and I felt cheap, and I said, no way, Jose. But uh, it looks pretty cool. They actually pull, like, right about where the falls are. and Not many people die from it, so that's, <laughs> that's good. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 13. You know, living is about growing, isn't it? And uh, when we are not growing, we're not living. And if you were just to take a plant that you see in the field and, and watch and water it, it grows and it's, it's alive and it's living, it's growing, it's moving. And, and, but if you were to take that plant and cut it down and throw it on top of the soil, it's not growing, so it's not living. And so these two, uh, they, they, they work in tandem. Uh, the alternative to living is dying. The alternative is dying. So growth is important. And this year we're looking through biblical characters and we're, uh, we're finding out what they did and what they didn't do. We're modeling after the good things and we are, we are throwing out all the bad things, but we're learning from it, right? We're, we're learning what not to do because we don't want to do something that's harmful. And I've said before that we can learn from the bad examples of others. And there are a lot of bad examples. There's a lot of mistakes we've all made, and, and uh, every mistake that we have made is not necessarily intentional either. Can I just say that? Let me say this. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Just because they've made a mistake or they've done something wrong doesn't mean that it was intentional. Is that fair to say? Can we give people the benefit of the doubt? Can we not be so negative just as a people, as, as a Christian? Like, I, think, I, I think when you look across the, the political spectrums, when you look across the religious spectrums, everybody has just this angst against one another. If, if you vary a little bit in opinion, man, just, you are absolutely wrong, you mean to be wrong, and, and then it's just means for attack. And, and I think that we can give people the benefit of the doubt. Now, I know all people are not good people, right? There is, there is none that doeth good, right? Okay, we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. We know the Bible verses, but let's just face it. Uh, people make mistakes, but we can learn from those mistakes, can't we? We can learn from those mistakes. We can look at a mistake that somebody has made, and we can be better because of the mistakes that they've made. We don't have to make the same mistakes. So let's give people the, the benefit of the doubt because we can learn from their mistakes, right? History that is forgotten will often be repeated. So let's look back at some of these Bible characters. Let's, let's extract some of these things that are bad examples, and let's say, now, let's, let's not repeat those things. Let's learn from them. Lot is a great example. The Bible character Lot, we're talking Abraham's nephew, is a great example of a bad example. So let's look this morning and see how Lot's decisions led to Lot's destruction. So if you're not there, open up to Genesis 13, and let's talk a little bit about Lot's decisions. Now, whatever 
whenever we think about our past, there's got to be something in our past where maybe you would say, this one thing had I done or had I not done would have significantly changed the outcome, right? Would you all say that? Yes, amen. Maybe there's something, there's that one thing that you said, that was a big no-no. That was a big mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was something that you said, you know what I should have done? I should have done this. And had I had done that one decision, that one thing, it would have changed the landscape of my life. I think an easy one to talk about really is the act of salvation, right? Was it the moment of your salvation? Now, that's really easy to look at because it's real simple. It changes the course of all of our eternal lives, and it's guaranteed, right? We know that we will be in heaven because we've placed our faith in Christ alone. That changes the landscape of eternity for you forever. So that's, that's an easy one, right? A 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're saved forever. Today was that day, or maybe 10 years ago was that day, or maybe 20 years ago was that day, and that changed your life forever. And that's a wonderful moment in time that you can say, had I had not made that decision, I would not be going to heaven. How about the, uh, the moment of discipleship? The moment of discipleship. The time where you began to follow the Lord's commandments. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 8, 21 and 22. It says this, and another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. How many of us have said that to the Lord? Maybe not those exact words. But Lord, I really, there's something else that I must do before I come and actually begin to follow you. There's something that is more important than following you. So that moment of discipleship, that moment in time when you said, no, Lord, I will follow you. If you read on in verse 22, but Jesus said unto him, follow me, and watch this, and let the dead bury their dead. Let the world take care of the world's things. I remember the moment in time when that became real to me. I was on the fire department in uh, in northern Minnesota, uh, and I was getting all sorts of persecution for being a Christian, and, and, and you know the story. I've mentioned it to you before, and, and I was out driving with this guy whose name is Jeff Jackson. And he didn't say, Joe, let the dead bury the dead. You know what he said? He said, Joe, you have other fires to fight. Here's what he said to me. Let the firemen fight the fires. Let the dead bury the dead. There's something that's more important for you than fighting fires. Now, with fighting fires, that's a, that's, a, that's a good quality. That's a fine thing. And if you're a fireman or if you know a fireman, I'm not, uh, I'm not taking anything away from that. I think that's important. But the reality is, for me, that was the moment in time I said, yes, Lord. Had I had not made that one decision, now listen, had I not made the decision of salvation, I would be saved, but I might not be married to my wife. I might not have have my two kids. I might have kids. might not be these two kids. Had I had not said yes to the Lord in that very moment of time where I said, you know, I'm going to go to Bible college. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the Lord. I'm going to let the firemen fight the fires. I'm going to let the dead bury the dead. This is what God has called me to do in this very moment. If had I had not done that, I would not have this wonderful wife and wonderful kids. That's a moment in time for me. What was your moment in time? You see, our decisions have everything to do with our destinations. You have to make the right decision to wind up at the right destination, right? So we need to think about what it is that Lot did in his life and what he didn't do. Let's examine this decision that he made and determine, is this the moment in time that you need to say, yes, Lord? Because Lot did not make good decisions. You know, at the first, he was doing all right. In Genesis 13, he was doing all right. He was with his uncle Abraham, and he had a a tremendous amount of wealth, and he probably enjoyed the wealth and prosperity that his family and his friends brought with him. He he probably enjoyed the warmth of uh, of fellowship with all of those friends that he had. He, He was in a good place, I think, in Genesis 13, but something came up. And let me read this text to you this morning. And Abraham went out, went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, And all that he had, and Lot with him, 
into the south. So there it is, right there in verse 1. Lot is with Abram, and they went out together. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Now, is having cattle wrong? No. Is having silver wrong? No. Is having gold wrong? No. I, I, don't, I don't have any, any cattle. <laughs> Maybe a little silver and gold, but I don't have any cattle. Is wealth wrong for a Christian to have? Of course not. We can be distracted by it. It can be all-consuming to us, and we have to be careful of it. In verse 3, and he went on his journeys from the south, even Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, that's neat. You know, Abraham had a very, uh, he had a, there was a, a, a spiritual significance in his life. He had this, this place, this altar where he worshiped his Lord. Verse 5, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. So Lot wasn't broke either. These two guys had abundance. In verse 6, And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. You can't have too many cooks in the kitchen, I suppose. I suppose you get these two guys together and there's so much abundance that they, even, they can't even dwell together. I suppose maybe putting Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos in the same house might be a bad idea. Verse 7, and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzites dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we are brethren. First time brethren is used in the Bible. Why can't we get along? Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham says, you, you, if, if you go this way, then I'll just go that way. And if you go this way, then I'll go that way. I mean, can you imagine the humility of Abraham to an extent to say, I'll take the, I'll take the leftovers. We have all this land before us, and whatever you leave me, I'll be happy with. I'll just take the remnant. But there was a decision that was made that affected their destination, didn't it? And we have to be careful of that. So let's look real quick at a lack of reconciliation. A lack of reconciliation. Why didn't they get together and just work things out? Why is there within the church as a whole a lack of reconciliation within the brethren? You got two wealthy dudes hanging out together. I mean, they, they, were, they, they were family for, for, for better sake. I mean, they, they, they could have easily, I think, they probably could have just gotten along. But they didn't. There's a lack of reconciliation. Maybe it would have taken firing some servants, Right? I mean, obviously their team wasn't getting along with the other person's team. You have a couple, couple knuckleheads, and maybe they're just like, why can't you just get along with one another, you know? You, you're gone. <laughs> Zunder became strife between Abram and Lot. Could have given away a lot of wealth. I mean, and this is, this is maybe the fault of both of theirs. They could have said, you know what, I, it's, it's not worth the strife. It's not worth the strife. Lot, here, take it all. But I will get along with you. Maybe Lot would have said to Abram, you know what, Abram? It's not worth the strife. I'm not going anywhere. Let's, why can't we just get along? Let's, let's reconcile. Let's make this right. But one of the quickest things they probably could have done was apologize 
to one another. Now, listen, there's a lot here in, in, that, that, that God knows that I don't know. I can't put something into the text. Maybe there was an apology. Maybe there was this discussion. I mean, I don't know. It wasn't recorded. But why couldn't there have been some reconciliation? I think one thing gets in the way of our reconciling, and it's a word that we call pride. How many times has pride gotten in the way of you reconciling with someone? That's a mean, ugly word, isn't it? Pride. Galatians 6, 3, for if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. You know how many of us are deceived by thinking we're something we're not? By thinking we're better than the next person? Romans 12, 3 says, For I say, the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. How many of us think soberly about who we really are? You know, pride gets in the way of reconciling. These, these probably were not significant differences. Can I just say that? They were probably not significant differences. Just a couple knuckleheads that they had as part of their staff. They couldn't get along with other staff. Now, I thank God we've got a great staff. We really, really do. And we've got a great church, but there's a lot of churches out there that just don't get along. You all know churches like that where they have infighting conflict, and everybody is trying to just clamor for the top. Reconciliation is often the right answer among Christians, but pride gets in the way. It keeps us from doing what we know we need to be doing. And had Abraham, Abraham rather, and Lot reconciled It could have been a vastly different outcome for Lot and his family. But Lot and his family had a tough go at it, didn't they? So there was a lack of reconciliation, and there was an increase in separation. This was uh, ultimately the decision they made, this separation. You know, the things that unite this family are greater than the things that separate them. And can I say this within the church? The things that unite the people within the church are far greater than the things that separate them. You hear that? Listen, 90% of the things that we believe are, 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 are the same. Probably more than 90%. I would say that within a church, I would say politically, fiscally, uh, ideology, ideologically, uh, theologically, Philosophically, for the most part, 90% of what we believe is in line with one another. And yet, you know what? At times, they're still infighting, isn't there? Isn't that just crazy? I just, I can't, I can't get that. I would say Abraham and Lot probably agreed on the vast majority of things, grew up in essentially the same household, essentially the same time, geographically the same. They probably understood finances pretty close to the same. And yet they separated. Though for the vast majority of what they believed was identical. Now you take the given Christian and you put him on the street in the world, probably agrees less than 10%. But yet the Christian gets along with the world. Explain that to me. The world does not agree with us theologically doesn't agree with us politically, doesn't agree with us philosophically. And yet at the same time, we've got Christians that get along with the world more than Christians get along with their brothers in Christ. Explain that to me. I don't get it. Can't look past differences? They can't lay down their arms and say, hey, brother, you know what? We need to get right. There's this increased amount of separation within the within the church. Now, uh, can I say this? There are times to separate. You separate for sin, and you, you separate for, 
for, for worldliness and things of that nature. Of course, for, for things that are, are not sound doctrine, I get it. You know, if we separate ourselves from everything that, we, that, 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 that doesn't agree 100% with us, we are going to be very lonely. We're going to be so lonely. We're going to be the only person that stands in one church or one place. At some time, there's got to be compromise. Not negatively. I'm not talking about compromising with sin and worldliness and things of that nature. What I'm simply saying is sometimes you just have to say, brother, man, I love you. And it's not worth not getting along. You have to get along. You have to be kind to one another. And if my servant isn't getting along with your servant, Brother Abram, I'm going to take my servant out there. Back in that day, you could probably stone him. <laughs> I mean, you could just have a good old lashing, baby. I mean, now there would probably be some sort of regulation against that, you know. It's written in the fine print of all of the codes that you get with the state when you start a business. You cannot stone your employees. Now, your employees can get stoned. I just wanted to say that, of course. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother. Now listen to this. Means of separation. Be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Don't even eat with the guy or the girl. There's a means for separation when it comes to worldliness. If you're, if you're with a brother in Christ and they're, and they're living a riotous worldly life, yes, it's time that you say, man, I love you, brother. You mean the world to me. But I just can't be with you right now. Because you're living a life that is incongruent to that of a, of a follower of Jesus Christ. Sound doctrine is another one, Romans 16, 17. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Avoid those people, even though they're brothers. I'm not saying that there's never a time for separation. I'm saying that, we, that at times we over-separate. But there's also times we over-compromise. We overcompromise as well, and we have to be careful of that. While reconciliation is often the right answer among Christians, separation is oftentimes not the right answer among Christians. And before you separate, you should look at all the things you have in common and ask yourself, ask yourself questions like, does it really matter? I know churches that separate themselves over, over uh, their philosophy of, of ministry. We have to be careful of that. Listen, I have my own philosophy of ministry. I do. But does that mean that I'm going to be a hater of other people who have a different philosophy of ministry? If it's not dogmatic doctrine, I have to be very, very careful. Or else we're going to alienate ourselves, and you're going to alienate yourselves. And so as a church, if we want to grow, we have to remember to reconcile when we can reconcile. There are times that you cannot reconcile. Did you know that? There are times that just things cannot be reconciled. Maybe this was a time. Maybe this was a time that there was no possible chance of reconciling. And maybe this could have been reconciled had somebody, maybe like Lot, not sought worldliness, and we'll get into that in a second. So let's look at Lot's destruction. So that was Lot's decision. Let's look at Lot's destruction. And, and Lot's destruction came directly from his decision. So if, if, if you have the decisions are wrong, your destination will be wrong. So in this case, I believe his decision was wrong, and so... His, his destination became his destruction, or rather his destruction was the destination. In Genesis 13, beginning in verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, 
everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think Sodom and Gomorrah was a beautiful place before it was destroyed. That's what the Bible says. Probably a beautiful place. It says, even as the garden of the Lord. I think it was like the Garden of Eden. That's an amazing place. Like the land of Egypt. Now remember, they just left this place of Egypt together. It says that in verse 1, and Abram went up out of Egypt. He looked at, he looked at the, this, this place like the place he came from. It was like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Listen to this great verse in verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They didn't just say that they were wicked men or that they were evil men. They were exceedingly wicked, exceedingly evil people there in that place. One commentator put it this way, that Lot had Egypt or the world in his heart. You know, Lot wasn't thinking for, uh, for, for the betterment of, of the faith, per se. He wasn't thinking about the betterment of his family. He had, he had the, the lust and the, uh, the, this, this desire to be back where he came from. He had Egypt in his heart. We have to be careful that we don't have the world stuck in our heart when we've come out of it. God has called us out of these things. By the grace of God, we don't want to go back to them. Do you have the world in your heart? The Bible tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Do you have that? Do you have a love for the world in your heart? People say, well, God made the world, and we ought to love it. <laughs> we, ought, we ought to love the, 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 the world, the earth, yes. Yes, in, in, in that sense. But not the system. Not the system. The world system. That's what he's talking about. Do you have that in your heart? Do you, do, you long for, do you long for riches? Do you long for things that, the, that wealth can buy? Are you more concerned with keeping the things the world has to offer than to separating from the brethren? I, I'm, I'm more concerned. I would rather stay with the brethren. I would rather be right with God and wrong with the world. I don't want what they have to offer. 1 Timothy 6.17, charge them that are rich in this world. That they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. You know why? Because the riches of this world are uncertain. <clears throat> People think they can take them with them. People think that they, if, if they have money, they can have everything that life has to offer. And they can still be broke, spiritually broke. And still have not what they thought they would get had they had a million dollars. Riches are so uncertain. Some may say, well, I, I, I'm not after the riches of the world. But in their heart, they're after what the riches of this world can buy. They say, I'm not after the money, but they're after what money can buy. And we have to be careful. We have to be able to distinguish that in our own hearts, in our own lives. Don't be materialistic. Lot had Egypt in his heart. He didn't say to Abram, Abram, you pick. I'll take whatever's left over. I don't want what the world has. It said nothing in here about Lot and his, and his altar. It didn't say that he went and sought God on this matter. Lot chose the material things over the spiritual things, and it led him to his destruction. At, at the end, Lot didn't have anything. I mean, Sodom was destroyed. His wife was turned to a, a pillar of salt. His kids got him drunk and had incest with them. He had nothing left over. And you know what? He, 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 he thought he had the world at his fingertips. This, this, this wonderful oasis, it was, it was like the garden of the Lord. It was like back in Egypt. 
and he had nothing. He became so, so caught up in the world's system of materialism. He had nothing. 2 Peter 2.8, For the righteous man dwelt among them, and seeing and hearing, you know what happened? He vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their, listen to this, unlawful deeds. They, they were unlawful. He vexed his soul. How many people in this room <clears throat> have been in a situation where they have been around people who, who cuss and swear? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. How many people in this room have been around people who tell uh, inappropriate jokes? Anybody? How many people in this room are, have been around people who listen to just the raunchiest type of, of music? Anybody? Anybody? So raunchy music, raunchy language. I mean, it's, it's, it, is, it vexes you, doesn't it? It ought to vex you. It ought to hurt you. As you sit there and, and you listen to it, you've got to say to yourself, man, this is just brutal. And you know what? That's where Lot lived. And you know, because he lived there, do you know who it affected? It affected his family. He was so concerned about the world that, his, that he sacrificed his family. Do you think Lot's wife, that you, that you, think, she, you think she did all of the things a wife is to do, and then and then come come out of that, not not be not be tantalized by all of that materialism. Do you think she went went to Sodom and said, "Man, I'm just I'm just living here, and I'm just going to be a spiritual individual, and and, and I'm just going to love the Lord in the midst of all this oppression"? You think that that happened without her being tainted at all? I mean, remember, she looked back as well, didn't she? I mean, you think about the kids. You don't just, you don't just drum this up by living in a, in, a, in, in a spiritually protected environment. The reason the kids did what they did is because they lived where they lived, right? We have to be so careful of that. There's that song, careful little eyes what you see. Was it careful little ears what you hear? I won't sing it for you because I'll be just ruin the song. How else does the song go? Something, something, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Father of love is looking down in love. Careful the eyes which see. I don't know. I just, we have to be so careful. Protect your ears. Protect your eyes. Protect your, your, your spiritual well-being. Or else you know what's going to happen? We're in a black lot. And we're going to say, wow, you know what? Let's take this land over reconciliation. I would rather... Separate. You could be like Lot and say, I would rather separate and be away from my brethren, be away from God's best for me in order to have what the world has. And can I say that we can learn from this example? That we can, we can learn from this example of what not to do. We need to choose God and the things of God over the things of this world. We need to choose better. We need to have a better decision because our decisions will determine our destinations. And we'll end up exactly where we don't want to be if we're not careful. Are you seeking abundance? Are you seeking increase? Well, you're not going to be satisfied with your increase. And you're going to keep accumulating and accumulating. You're not going to be happy with that either. You're still going to be spiritually destitute. You're going to desire something more. We begin to make wrong decisions that are going to lead us to the wrong destinations because of our wrong desires. Where are your desires? Are your desires for the things of God? I wish this story would have turned out differently for Lot's family, but it didn't. If you live in the world, and if you are in love with the world, you're going to get exactly what the world has to offer. Be so careful of this, friends. We need to grow this here. We need to grow this here and beware of our decisions that we make. Beware of the decisions you make because it's going to lead you to the destinations 
that maybe you desire and maybe you don't desire. We've all made decisions that we regret, even if they're small decisions. Isn't that interesting? Even small decisions can, mean a, can, have, can have big disasters. Smallest of decisions. In the coming months, we're going to talk about David. I mean, that's just a, a prime example of a small little decision turned into a catastrophic disaster. But those aren't the only things. We're not just talking about adultery here. We're talking about all manner of things. You have to be very, very careful. We need to grow this year. Keep moving forward. Move forward. Move, move towards reconciliation. Because that's, I think that's the right thing to do most of the time. Most of the time. There are times you can't reconcile. I get it. But I think most of the time you can. I think there are times you don't have to separate, but we separate because it's the easy thing to do. It's the easy thing to do. We're just going to separate because I'm not going to give up any ground. Oh, that's stubborn pride. You can't say, hey, you know what? Listen, this matters, this matters, this doesn't matter so much. You know, you see it a lot right now in the, in the political sphere, don't you? You see a lot in the political sphere. You see, you, see, you see two groups of people, probably multiple groups of people, but two specific groups of people who just can't get along. And as opposed to them saying, hey, listen, we got some good ideas, you got some good ideas, the bottom line is I don't think the Democrats are out to kill us, and I don't think the Republicans are out to kill you either. I think that there is, there is a heart for thinking good of people, And listen, there's, we have to be so careful, don't we? Be so careful. Try to reconcile with your brothers, with your brethren, brothers in Christ, and in your family too, your, your actual physical brothers and sisters. Not so important to reconcile with your sisters, especially if they're your little sister. You can always pick on them. But your brothers, especially if they're big brothers, you need to reconcile with them. They will squash you. And I look to Ben and Josh, and I oftentimes say to Josh, stop beating up on your older brother. <laughs> the things we have in common are far greater than things that we, than we do not have in common. So let's be careful of that. Let's learn from Lot. Let's learn from his decisions. Let's not seek the world, but let's seek God in his word. Can we do that? I think everybody here knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm thankful for that. Actually, I, 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 wish, I wish we had 100 people here who didn't know Christ because it would be a good opportunity to, to win them to the Lord. And maybe that day will come again. I think it will, eventually. I think it will come again, hopefully sooner rather than later. People are still scared to come out. I realize that, um, that Zoom is very easy. You just dial in. You, don't have to, you could be in your pajamas. All I see is like names on screens. Some of these people... Might be in their pajamas. Some of them might have walked away from the phone. Now, I don't think so. I think all these people that joined us via Zoom are, are legit and they want to be a part. And hopefully, hopefully this pandemic in the fall doesn't have an uptick and they can all join us again. But I wish we had 100 people here who didn't know Christ as our Savior. But I believe that you do. And if you do, we need to share that salvation with other people. Because today is the day of salvation, isn't it? Today is the day of salvation. I'm so thankful that God saved me from my sin. And I'm thankful he saved you from yours.